Hello, everyone. Welcome to our event today. This is the fourth event we have, Peru in the Spotlight. And uh, this is a series of events that, that we are having in Latin America in the Spotlight. Today, we are presenting the last country of the, uh, La uh, uh, the Pacific Alliance countries uh, in, in that uh, specific section. So Peru in the Spotlight uh, is a presented thank you uh, to all our sponsors, uh, Bright Immigration, OVH, a Cloud, OCL Law, uh, the City of Toronto, all of them have been big contributors to uh, this type of event. So today, we have a very um, interesting uh, conversation with uh, some speakers that we are going to have from Peru. We also are going to have a presentation. I'm going to start with that presentation just in a minute, uh, you know, about uh, Peru. And uh, then we are presenting a new white paper. If you go to our website right now, uh, you will notice that uh, the white paper is already there. So you can download uh, the white paper about Peru. Uh, this is going to be a fantastic time uh, for you guys to learn about uh, this ecosystem. So I'm going to start the presentation here. And uh, Sorry, one second. There, I'm sharing my presentation. And there you go. So you are going to see soon. There you go. That's uh, our presentation today about the white paper. I'm going to be speaking here uh, with you about what we find out uh, during this 2021, uh, you know, startup ecosystem, uh, you know, research, and uh, you know, presenting you with some specific aspects about Peru. Uh, but you know, before we start, I would like to uh, let you know about our agenda. So uh, we are going to see something about the economic overview. Uh, the startup ecosystem, key tech sectors, and uh, uh, challenges and resources as uh, other times. And of course, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Uh, they are fantastic people in the startup ecosystem in Peru that will help you to clarify any of the questions. So if you are in the audience and you have questions, please go ahead, ask your, those questions to our experts. If you are thinking something in mind uh, right now, you can start probably put it in the chat, in the event chat, or in the bar, uh, in the stay chat. Uh, so uh, starting to say, you know, before we enter into statistics and all that, that Peru is a very influential player. Uh, the Peruvian economy is an emerging social uh, market economy, highly dependent on foreign trade and classified as upper middle income economy by the World Bank. And Peru is an open economy along with other advantages. Peru also offers the uh, resourcefulness uh, of its people and will aid uh, in these uh, tough uh, times. Uh, as you know, all the countries, uh, you know, have been, uh, of course, suffering from the pandemic. And this has been, you know, uh, no different for a country like Peru. So the estimated population in Peru, just for you, your reference is 31.5 million uh, people. So about the size of uh, the Canadian population. Um, the, today, uh, Peru's economy is still heavily uh, relying on ex exports, uh, making the country economy vulnerable to a fluctuation in the world market prices and the world economy policies, uh, policies and decisions. Uh, so I'm going to pass here some uh, of the uh, statistics that we have seen. Uh, so the Peruvian economy actually offers a favorable uh, environment for foreign investment. And uh, from 2009 and 2019, Peru GDP increased at average of 4.4% annually. Um, so the good international relations are vital uh, importance for Peru's growth and indeed uh, to every country's economy. Uh, free trade agreements uh, have granted Peru, um, a, you know, a competitive economy and broadened export trade. So Peru currently has uh, FTAs assigned with many countries, uh, between them, of course, our country here, Canada, uh, with Chile, China, uh, the European Union, Mexico, Panama, the US, and the Mercosur countries, uh, which includes Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay. Um, I have to say, uh, as, as the beginning when I was presenting here, that Peru is a part of the uh, Pacific Alliance. Uh, so this is Colombia, Chile, Mexico, and of course, Peru, you know, this is a strong economy in Latin America represents 50% of the investment in the whole region. 
as for an investor, uh, uh, you know, th there's, there are some opportunities and you will obtain equal uh, treatment as right as domestic companies. Uh, there is no restrictions of trading and restricted access to domestic or foreign credit, uh, freedom to possess and use local or foreign currency uh, from most of operations, uh, freedom of uh, on purchasing Peruvian corporate shares, and uh, warranted legal stability in terms of taxes and dividends. And uh, this is, um, a, you know, a fact that you probably don't know about Peru. Some of you may know. Uh, Peru uh, has uh, its local uh, currency, that is uh, solis, uh, but they also use the U.S. dollar very, very frequently. So it's very uh, normal that, uh, you know, people in Peru has uh, accounts, uh, bank accounts in U.S. dollars and in their uh, local currency. So... In Peru, also, uh, there are endless, uh, you know, opportunities for new startups to deliver high quality services and a wider variety of goods that are, uh, are presently difficult to find in the region or even inaccessible. Uh, so, in the over the past decade, uh, Peru has been one of the region's fastest growing economies uh, with an average growth of uh, 5.9% uh, in context uh, with a low inflation so far. Um, of course, uh, as I mentioned, COVID-19 impact, uh, you know, there are some uh, negative numbers in there uh, due to the pandemic. So the employment fell in average 20% between April and December. And in response, the government launched a global uh, program of economic compensation and aid to protect vulnerable uh, population and support businesses, which includes cash transfer, uh, postponing tax payments and credit guarantees for the private sector. Um, the other uh, thing that you should consider is uh, what is uh, what is going on, you know, right now there is a new government. Uh, we, we can probably speak with uh, the, the speakers uh, later on about this part because it's a totally new, you know, approach uh, that they are having right now. But so far, until we finish the white paper, uh, the outlook for 2021, considering the debt reception uh, on 2020, uh, is a strong rebound uh, is expected in 2021, assuming that public investment will be a faster pace and uh, that better international conditions will result from implementation of COVID-19 vaccination campaign, which so far I know is rolling up. And at uh, domestic uh, level, the prevalence uh, for some restrictions, uh, risk uh, aversion and uncertainty may slow recording of private spending. Uh, in, the, in this context, uh, despite the strong rebound, uh, GDP will remain below uh, the uh, pre-pandemic uh, level, uh, we believe so far. Um, you will find a lot of information in our white paper from the sources that, uh, you know, where we got all this information. If you're curious to get a little bit deeper about the numbers and context that we are proposing in this white paper. So some other economic, uh, you know, aspects that you may like to consider. 37% GDP growth was reported for the third quarter of 2020. Uh, after uh, minus 27.1% GDP growth uh, was reported in the second quarter of 2020. So it, it's good that we can see so far, you know, uh, that it's rebounding uh, the economy and uh, it's started to grow again. Um, uh, 3,370 uh, million US dollars was how much the foreign investment in Peru increased by the first quarter of 2020 and raising rep rapidly after a decreasing by uh, $490 million in the second quarter of 2020. Uh, now, uh, another statistic, 9.4% is the unemployment rate uh, through June 2021, which has been a decrease since the peak over 16% during the uh, 2020 uh, year. And it's still a much higher than a 2019 rate uh, that is 6%. Um, the other number, 3.8%, uh, is the annual inflation rate for July 2021, which has been st steadily increasing since 2018. We know here in our country, also in Canada, we are, uh, you know, uh, experiencing an increase on uh, inflation. I think that's a global kind of impact that is happening so far. 
Um, Peru has a strong economy fundamentals, which allows the stability and consistent growth through uh, the last decade anyway. But, um, you know, another statistic that you are going to see there, 3.9% of Peru GDP was the foreign direct investment in Peru in 2019. And after experiencing a decrease of 2.9% uh, in 2018, this is what we are seeing so far. Uh, these, all these numbers are changing really, really fast. And we are expecting that, uh, you know, um, it keeps changing uh, due to the new government, due to the new conditions after the pandemic, as many other uh, countries are moving uh, after all this. Um, I'm going to start talking about the startup ecosystem here. Uh, so in regards of the startup ecosystem, uh, although Peru came in late in the startup game, let's say, uh, in compared with some other countries in Latin America, public policy agencies have been able to learn from uh, the neighbor countries, especially in, in the uh, Pacific Alliance, and apply uh, the ones that are, made, are making sense for the local ecosystem. Therefore, uh, the startup ecosystem in Peru has grown fast and in the right direction. In that sense, Startup Peru, a government program that provides seed funding for startups and funding for other stakeholders of the local ecosystem has been key actor for investment in the ecosystem. And for every dollar invested uh, through the Startup Peru program, three dollars are invested from private stakeholders. Uh, that includes includes accelerators, angel investment, and corporate uh, VC. So Startup Peru, in some ways, in some ways, uh, kind of, uh, you know, similar to Startup Chile, um, but of course, Startup Chile kind of runs their own program. Um, it is, it's going to be fascinating for some of you to understand, you know, how every country in Latin America, uh, you know, runs uh, different type of programs, uh, you know, with, with similar uh, approach. So uh, important for you to know that there are, you know, even though you want to expand, if you if that's in your plans, you will have a local support, uh, you know, from this type of institutions. So uh, the appetite for startups investment is growing in Peru uh, with an increased number of investments uh, in, in startups happening every quarter. In 2018 and 2018, Startup Peru provided uh, funding to 109 and 84 local startups respectively. Uh, while in 2018, there was just um, 24 uh, private invest investment deals, adding uh, $9.1 million in uh, first quarter of 2019. Uh, they have already uh, been like 12 uh, deals using $6.6 .6 million with more than 60% of those funds coming from international investors. Peru is also a good position to receive international entrepreneurs through the Startup Peru Plug program, and where they can receive uh, public funding and access to local ecosystem through the uh, network uh, of accelerators uh, that are a part of the Startup Peru program. Uh, so important also to note that uh, you know Lima is kind of uh, the the most uh, you know e economy that is. Um, it's, it's probably the one that is representing the most uh, uh, right now in, in Peru. But, uh, you know, there is also Arequipa. There are some people that don't take in consideration uh, Arequipa. Um, and that's, a, you know, a, a, another city. Same as you can see, for example, in Colombia, you have Bogota, Medellin. In, in Mexico, you have, uh, you know, Mexico City, Guadalajara, Monterrey. In Peru is Lima, Arequipa. Uh, so just take in consideration that because Arequipa also uh, enjoys a position being the producer of perhaps the best talent in computer science in Peru and the startup ecosystem is an initial growth stage with regular ecosystem events happening every week uh, led by every expanding group uh, you know, of funders uh, and ecosystem leaders. Uh, it will be interesting to know during the pandemic how they have keep up uh, you know, uh, with those events and those connections. I think that will be probably a good ask uh, to our experts today. Um, now, uh, we are going to start talking about here, I'm going to start talking here about the, um, uh, the tech sectors. And um, before I go that, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit here uh, you know, to provide some uh, extra information that you may want to know about the startup ecosystem, uh, you will find it again in, in our white paper. 
But just for you to know, uh, you know, there are 35 uh, venture capital transactions that were completed in Peru during 2019 uh, from 24 reported last, uh, uh, a year earlier. Um, there are uh, three, uh, over 3,000, almost 3,500 entrepreneurial projects uh, have been financed by, uh, financed, financed by <laughs> Innovate Peru. Uh, since in its inception, and uh, which allow uh, for Peru to see the highest rate of startup creation ever. And 40% of the capital in 2019 went towards fintech startups with 37% towards tech startups. We're going to talk about that in, uh, you know, the uh, startup sectors. Um, you are going to see that uh, we are going to have uh, three specific sectors uh, that we are going to be highlighting today. Uh, so in between them, edtech, fintech, and agricultural technology, uh, those are the sectors that we are anticipating to highlight in this uh, part of the white paper. So talking about edtech, uh, you know, this, uh, this is a sector that before we saw that, uh, you know, it was not that much before the pandemic. <laughs> Wasn't, it was growing, but not that much during the pandemic, certainly uh, became a boom. Online learning is uh, growing in popularity uh, during uh, you know this time of COVID-19, as the outside uh, world is uh, you know is restricted. Uh, it makes sense that tech in Peru is no exception, as the country, with some of the strictest quarantine rules in the region, tries to keep uh, some uh, semblance uh, of normality. And so all the ingredients uh, exist in Lima to become a hub for innovation in edu in education uh, in Latin America. Uh, one of the examples of the Utec Ventures, uh, which is an institution in, in Peru that works with startups, uh, recently uh, had a decision to launch it, an EdTech program. And uh, one of the few, uh, the few sector specific initiatives in Lima uh, will add further uh, support and incentives for the regional uh, startup ecosystem in Peru. Um, some of the uh, challenges that you know the ecosystem is actually facing in in this sector is the uh, largest hurdle uh, for ed tech startups is developing a strong market purchase uh, of their products, uh, while some of the content can be relatively cheap and affordable for most educational technologies uh, come with a heavy cost. In recent studies. Uh, demonstrated that over 75% of teachers and um, administrators thought that budget restrictions were the biggest challenge to embrace uh, educational technology. Uh, so this is something for, uh, you know, in, in many parts, not just in Peru, but in many other countries also to improve. Uh, so we know that the Minister of Education is curing uh, digital content and his uh, own content as well as content for, uh, from allies and partners and supporting the creation of uh, new talent to have content that aligns with all the curricula. <laughs> and over 30% of the venture capital investment, as I mentioned before in one of these slides in Peru, uh, over uh, uh, the venture capital investment in Peru over the first half of 2020 was invested into uh, tech startups. Um, the government and uh, Ministry of Education um, announced that the distribution of over uh, 800,000 tablets to children in rural areas and 97% of those, uh, 97,000 of those tablets for uh, uh, teachers. Uh, the plan is that all these tablets will have internet connection and in areas where is no electricity, the tablets will uh, be delivered uh, with solar charge, that's the plan. I'm not sure how it's going. Uh, so maybe some of our speakers may have some information about that. FinTech is another kind of, uh, you know, very common type of uh, a sector that we are always highlight in our white papers because in Latin America, FinTech is a big deal. Um, in Peru, at least, the fintech sector have experienced a boom in recent years, attested by continuous raise of venture capital investment. And as of uh, mid 2020, for instance, fintech was the one in the top of technology sectors in Peru, believed by entrepreneurs uh, to have benefited uh, most of the uh, from the pandemic as each year passes more Peruvian population hopes uh, in the uh, fintech uh, Badwagon uh, and providing the South American country to be fruitful market 
for the uh, for this type of industry. So the challenges uh, that you know this uh, industry is facing right now, uh, there is a high dependence on local networking and connections to have success in this sector. Additional, even though uh, there is a lot of venture capital in this sector, there is a continued trend for investment to be focused primarily primarily in proven startups which is kind of a common case for many other countries too. Uh, this is rapidly growing uh, competition in this sector and is only, uh, only the most successful uh, are often granted with significant investment. Uh, so um, some of the sub-sectors I want to highlight here, the payment and remittances is the leading sector with over 23% of the fintech market share. And uh, the following sector uh, are currently a, a exchange, finance, infrastructure for services, and financial solutions for companies. Uh, for the fresh industry, uh, you know, like the majority of Peruvian fintech startups consist no more than 10 employees, uh, fitting the idea of a young startup having a small and closely uh, 19. And then uh, in Peru, around 70% of the population is in bank. Uh, you may be finding that a little bit shocking, but unfortunately, in many parts of the, uh, in, in our Latin American countries, there is a huge number of the population that is still not uh, linking with banks, um, which equates about 40 million people. Uh, the industry is home only uh, approximately 120 startups, which leaves a lot of space for new organizations to grow. Uh, and then the increased investment, uh, part of the increased investment, despite being an emerging industry, uh, the fact that fintech accounts for over 7% of the country venture capital investment constitute uh, an acknowledgement uh, of its, its potential uh, with, within Peru financial market. Now that's about fintech and our final, uh, you know, a sector is the agricultural technology sector. And then we are going to be preparing to receive our speakers. So I will be asking, you know, our speakers, I see already Emilia and Lucia there, um, just to be waiting for another eight minutes and we are going to be speaking with you. Uh, so hopefully uh, Pedro is also joining us soon. Um, the agricultural technology, uh, the Peruvian agricultural provides a great opportunity for ag tech and food tech innovate innovations uh, as a startup school pilot uh, solutions starting from small farms uh, first before scaling abroad with larger clients. Uh, Peru is well known uh, for its uh, food and gastronomy. If you haven't tried Peruvian food, you should. It's delicious, it's amazing, uh, always missing uh, my Peruvian ceviche. <laughs> there is an increase in export-oriented agriculture that contributed to the country, impressive economic growth uh, with the help of growing wellness trends. Peru has a corporate advantage in uh, superfoods uh, that are popular with millennials globally. App tech and uh, food tech also gives Peru an opportunity to expand from its history of uh, production of most raw agricultural production uh, into value added uh, products and higher, uh, higher margins. So some of the challenges that you are going to see in this sector, um, you know, Alto Peru has a strong fundamental agricultural market. Many of other countries in Latin America are competing uh, for the same space. Countries such as Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico are also rapidly uh, um, advancing uh, their agricultural in infrastructure into incorporate IoT and ICT, attracting an increase, uh, increasing share of international investors. And by the way, our next event is Brazil in the spotlight, and after that, Argentina and Uruguay in the spotlight. And you will see, you know, how these countries are also leading in this uh, sector in particular. So uh, as a government initiative, Peru government, uh, the Peruvian government is initiated a plan over um, to uh, 177 uh, million US dollars from 2015 to 2019 to specifically develop technology innovation in the agricultural sector. The portfolio of projects is uh, directed by uh, National Institute uh, of Agricultural Innovation, who has consciously engaged diverse uh, regions in the country to be part uh, of it. 
Uh, now, in regards of the innovation, in 2020, Peru decided to carry out an open innovation process where companies and entrepreneurs have been called uh, on to present a pilot uh, solutions to provide information for decision making uh, of small agricultural producers. Uh, now, for the growth potential, uh, so you will see that, you know, an important contributor to the agricultural industry is the government. Peru participated in 2019 Anura Fair in Germany. The Peruvian agricultural workers secure financial commitments from investors for a value of 211 million US dollars. And the countries that reported interest in Germany Fran were Germany, France, and South Korea, Russia, um, United Kingdom, Turkey, India, and Poland. Uh, now, while the entrepreneurship is growing at an incredible pace uh, among uh, the companies working in AgTech uh, through Peru, is a, is a fraction of what uh, we find in the United States and in Canada. This means that providers can also concentrate in selling their idea and solutions itself. So those were the uh, sectors. And finally, I have here kind of the challenges uh, of a, you know, a, a trying to enter in the Peruvian market that you are going to find are very similar to other countries in Latin America and in general. If you go to any other country, uh, you know, that is different from Canada or the US, sometimes uh, you will find the similar challenges, but of course it comes with big rewards if you do it right. Uh, so starting business, it takes around 27 days and seven uh, producers, uh, produce uh, procedures, sorry, uh, to set up a business. The heaviest uh, procedures are signing the deed and incorporation before a notary and filling the online with the public registry uh, of commerce, which takes eight days and obtaining a municipal, uh, municipal license from the district uh, council, which takes about 15 days. Uh, now, some of other challenges that you're going to have is regarding taxes. All the residents are tax and income they earn worldwide, uh, while no residents, no residents are tax only with Peruvian earned income. Uh, for the purpose of taxation, a resident uh, is in, that is in Peru, Peruvian national or foreign national that has spent more than 180 days, 83 days um, in a year in the country. Now, uh, for pro, uh, protecting intellectual property, while well, the legal framework uh, for protection of intellectual property in Peru has improved over the past years, uh, the enforcement is uh, still uh, a little bit weak. Now, this is important because, uh, for example, now that we are having a boot camp, uh, you know, helping Canadian tech companies expanding into Latin America, you actually have that specific fund to protect your IP through can export innovation. So this is something that we, we probably are going to be talking a lot during that bootcamp. And remember, if you are located in Toronto, the city of Toronto is funding the bootcamp. So you don't have to pay for that bootcamp. Uh, if you are a Canadian company, you can actually uh, become a part of our bootcamp in November, uh, at the end of the November, and start looking for options to get uh, you know into these ecosystems. So as general recommendations, we just ask to collaborate with locals, uh, you know, to uh, make sure that you uh, get advice from uh, actually people in Peru that can uh, you can rely on the Trade Commissioner Office again. Either is the Peruvian Trade Commissioner Office or the Canadian Trade Commissioner Office uh, provide great support for international startups going there. Uh, there is a personal touch always. And remember that relationships in Latin America are important. So uh, you have to get into develop a strong connection, uh, you know, with business partners. And the language barriers, you know, English um, speaking investors and entrepreneurs should attempt to find an interpreter. Uh, but in the startup ecosystem, usually, usually we get people, uh, you know, with good level of English, uh, even though, you know, we always recommend that you can you can probably uh, uh, you know find somebody locally that can help you. Now it's time for us to introduce our speakers. After presenting here, uh, you know the white paper. I'm glad to have uh, here Emilio Navarro with City of uh, Abaxto Spa, uh, Lucia Montalvo, Vice President of Investment, and Pedro 
Stuart uh, Program Associate, and he's a pro uh, right now in UK. So guys, I'm going to stop sharing here. I'm going to start, uh, you know, uh, putting you in the room. So bear with me here. I'm going to add Emilio, Lucia, and Pedro. Thank you so much, guys, for being here. There you go. Emilio and Pedro are in. Hello. <laughs> and Lucia is just about to enter. Um, Hello, when... Miriam. Great, great seeing you. Yeah, great to see you, Pedro. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Yeah. Uh, so, Emilio and Pedro, while Lucia is connecting here, uh, I would like you guys to introduce yourself and we can start the questions. Uh, so, I'm going to start with Emilio. Emilio, can you give us a little bit of background, who you are, and what is your connection with the ecosystem so far? Okay. Uh, well, hello, everybody. My name, again, is Emilio Navarro. I'm, um, I'm a CTO of a startup that, um, that works in the uh, e-commerce segment. And I'm also president of the uh, Digital Association of Entrepreneurs in Peru. So pretty much we've been working on, on startups and LATAM for the last um, few years in Chile, Peru. Um, right now, I'm in Denver, Colorado. So mm -hmm. working out of Denver. And um, my, uh, my career has been technology, worked for several companies, being Autodesk, uh, as well as Moxarp, Digital Globe, Hitachi, and, and so on. So I'll let uh, Pedro talk now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Emilio. Pedro, go ahead. Thank you, Emilio. Well, uh, hi, everyone. Great seeing you. Um, I'm Pedro Stewart. I'm currently a program associate at Andler UK. I'm based here in London. As you mm -hmm. may see, it's, uh, it's almost night already. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> and well, uh, right now I'm currently a program associate, which means uh, I'm basically responsible of everything program related uh, from ensuring we deliver the best experience to our founders, uh, ensuring operations run smoothly, and also recruiting the best founders here in the UK for a program. Uh, before this, a year before I was in Peru, uh, I had a brief stint at the UTech Ventures, which is an accelerator in Lima, Peru. I think you mentioned the, mm -hmm. their new tech program that they just launched. And after that, I was also at COFIDE, which is Peru's National Development Bank, uh, working on them on a fund of funds project, which is now live. Uh, so I guess that's that's my link to the Peruvian ecosystem. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Pedro. And Lucia, thank you for, uh, uh, you know, connecting. I know sometimes it's difficult to connect <laughs> here in the proper. Uh, but <laughs> apologies nice to... for that. <laughs> no, no problem. No problem, Lucia. Nice to see you. Uh, we are just uh, starting with the introductions. Can you introduce yourself and let us know what is your connection with the ecosystem? Of course, and, and thank you for, for having me here. Um, my name is Lucia Montalvo, and I'm a uh, vice president at Salcantay Ventures, which is one of the venture capital funds here in, in Peru. We invest across Spanish-speaking Latin America in tech-enabled startups, and I've been working with them for over two years. Uh, in my prior life, I was an investment banker back home in Colombia. Oh, nice. I'm from Colombia. <laughs> oh, amazing. <laughs> okay, guys. So we are going to start with the first question. And Lucia, since, uh, you know, I started with you late, I would like to ask this first question to you. Uh, it's in regards of the trends in technology that you have seen in Peru. Um, can you let us know, you know, uh, besides the, the technology trends we presented today, what do you have seen so far raising up in technology? Um, I think a lot of things, but similar to like what happened in every other country, people have started engaging with technology like much more than before, right? So given the lockdown measures and social distancing, uh, people started to buy groceries online, the uh, children studying, uh, were studying virtually, people were like basically forced to work from home, um, seek uh, healthcare virtually. So in general, I think our, our, our relationship with technology has deepened. Um, and we, I think at Salcantay are convinced that this was not just uh, like uh, a, a juncture thing that is going to go away after the, we, we are over the pandemic. Uh, even though kids will eventually go back to school, although it's taking a little bit longer here in Peru and people have already started returning to the offices, um, I think we realized two things, uh, key things. One is that in many instances, technology can actually make our lives more convenient. 
uh, and two, uh, and I think most importantly, is that uh, technology will allow us to make our, like to give access to critical products and services, uh, such as healthcare, education, financial services to, to those people that didn't have access before. Um, so this, I think, will be a, a, a game changer because these were trends that were already happening before, but the pandemic helped accelerate them. And I mean, this is the same in Peru as in many other countries. Many other countries, that's right. Uh, Pedro, what do you have seen in regards of, uh, you know, new trends in the Peruvian ecosystem in regards to technology? Okay. Uh, I largely think the same as Lucia. Uh, definitely, there's been a trend towards digitalization that was already happening, but has been accelerated mm -hmm. by the onset of the pandemic. Uh, I, I guess that uh, probably some people in the public sh should know that Peru was a country that traditionally was not that digitalized compared mm -hmm. to other countries in Latin America. Uh, there was a really big cultural, probably cultural and, and, and skills gap on getting people to actually use digital mm -hmm. services, for, for example, uh, only 30% of the country, if I'm not wrong, uh, uses financial services at the moment. And obviously, uh, if we can see like a silver lining of the pandemic, it has accelerated the trends towards digitalization. Uh, and I think it's not a coincidence that we've seen during the last couple of years, uh, this boom of investment in, in sectors such as ed tech or, or food tech or fintech, which have benefited enormously of this uh, digitalization trend. Got it. Yeah, that, that's good to know. Uh, Emilio, uh, what is your take on this part? Well, my take, uh, Peru, when it comes to technology, has been, it's been more reactive than proactive. Um, the uh, pandemic helped accelerate the uh, usage of technology. Um, and like uh, Pedro and Lucia mentioned, I mean, we're talking about uh, um, cultural gap. Uh, people in Peru culturally are not prone to use technology as uh, a population like in Chile or Colombia. Uh, and just because of the pandemic, they started using it. However, you know, I'm coming from a technology, the technology side of the house. Uh, the development of technology is then, it has not been an order, orderly one. It's been done just because they needed to do it. And that has caused some issues and it's caused some issues in the ecosystem. So you have new uh, startups that are trying to help with it. However, I'll have my little one here behind me. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah, however, however um, it is getting better. But yeah, it's been more more reactive than proactive. Yeah, okay. Uh, that's that's good to know. And actually, we have a first question from the audience. I want to address it before because normally, uh, you know, we don't get, um, a, I get to answer the questions at the end really fast. And I, I just want to pass this to you guys. What is, a, what's, what is a challenge that companies from North America, Canada might face entering the Peruvian ecosystem? And how can we prepare for this challenge? So um, I would like to start with Pedro. Sure. Well, uh, I, I think you kind of also mentioned this during mm -hmm. while, while you were presenting this white paper. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the first challenge any Canadian entrepreneur is going to face in Peru, it's going to be bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I think that even though the, the onset of the pandemic has helped digitalize and, and make some process from the Peruvian government become faster and, and friendlier okay. to founders, uh, there's still so much more we can do on that regard. Uh, I think there are also some initiatives, even though there are some initiatives that uh, are already, that the government is kind of trying to, to apply to the ecosystem to like facilitate life to founders. Uh, there's still so much we can do in that regard. For example, Peru still doesn't count with a program uh, for a visa for entrepreneurs, such as mm -hmm. Canada does. Uh, so that would be a challenge that, uh, that a founder could find in Peru. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, how how you are facing those challenges, Emilio? What, what do you recommend for international startups when they are actually looking at those uh, challenges in the ecosystem? Yeah, I mean, you, you have several challenges. Like Pedro mentioned, one of them is the uh, the uh, bureaucracy. We don't have like like Chile does, like we negotiate in India, for example. You know, <laughs> so it's it's a huge process, long process. Uh, culturally, also, you gotta be aware that. Um, you cannot look at Latin America as a whole, uh, just one region. You got to look at each country as a different region 
and within the country, depending on where you go, also mm -hmm. you have to look at how they deal with um, with different type of technology or lack of technology for that matter, you know, communications. When we talk about technology, usually we talk about internet and in, in many areas they do not have internet access. So mm -hmm. a lot to be done. Uh, it's not impossible, but you gotta be patient on, on how to approach um, how um, how to do business with people. And also the, um, the last one I'm gonna mention, but it's not the least important is banking. Mm -hmm. uh, Many people just deal with cash, uh, and just now they are getting into systems for um, from fintech uh, startup, but it's a slow process. So it's, it's a, a lot of challenges going on there. Yeah, Lucia, you are there, and you come from another country. For what I understand, How, what do you recommend in, in this case for international startups that are entering? I, I think uh, like you guys covered a lot of it, but I think something that is key. Uh, in coming into Peru or Colombia or other countries in the region is that Latin America is a long-term play and we cannot like be scared with like the like political or macroeconomic noise that we usually tend to see like we uh, for instance are seeing some political instability in, in, in Peru right now uh, we need to realize that to be successful here we need to write those cycles So I think something that will be key for anyone coming into Peru is one, to be committed to, to succeeding in the country and maybe two, also uh, engaging with partners that will be um, supporting you in the longer term. It's like things that take a year in Canada or the U.S. are going to take much more here. Yeah, I mean, in, in many ways, you know, it's the same challenges that people are going to face going to India, China, some other countries, right? Uh, you know, there is also their own process going to uh, other emerging markets. And thank you to Daniel and Fatima for also putting in the chat, you know, some alternatives for people that are looking into expanding into Peru because there, there is a, a number of institutions and innovation centers that can help in those areas too. Uh, so for the next question, guys, uh, what type of startups do you think the Peruvian market will need for post pandemic? I'm going to start with Emilio with that one. What do you think the Peruvian is going to need in regards of technology going post pandemic? Well, uh, I think there are three three big ones. Uh, one of them is, is uh, fintech. Uh, we need to understand that uh, you have to be bankerized. I mean, you have to to be part of the banking system in order mm -hmm. to uh, succeed nowadays with the global economy. The other one um, that I would like to mention uh, is uh, medtech. Uh, a lot of uh, startups are looking into medtech outside Peru, but not in Peru. So that is that is big. That's something that that is going to be a big market there. And I don't want to put aside ag tech and, and, and other ones, but ed tech uh, also is an important one. Uh, nowadays, I mean, with the pandemic, you can see that it's been utilized a lot and that's something that is needed to be done. We have in Peru several startups that, uh, that offer services, ed tech services, and they've been successful during the pandemic. So Got that's it. the three ones that I see. Oh, got it. Um, hey Pedro, uh, what do you think about that? So I, I, I agree with Emilio. Uh, EdTech and FinTech are absolutely very interesting sectors with like very good perspectives of, of growth. Uh, maybe if I, I would I have to add one sector to those, it would probably be food tech. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's a sector that has benefited enormously on how like uh, on the new way Peruvians are kind of accessing these services through like uh, digital means. Uh, I also think it's really interesting that uh, such a country, that, that such a country, you know, like Peru has this really big tradition on, and culture and on cuisine and gastronomy. Uh, so I really think that it's interesting like that during the latest months, uh, we've seen a lot, of, a lot of investment going on on these types of startups. And I think we could actually like leverage this tradition on creating new startups on this field and you know like uh, taking advantage of these opportunities right it now. makes a lot of sense uh, being mm -hmm. peru so strong in food uh you know in cuisine so lucia what is your take on this and you are in the investment side so what do you think peru is going to need in, in the tech part i totally agree with that tech i think it, uh education is key for like 
society to to be able to train the next generation in, in like people in the next generation uh skills uh, and we know as as Pedro mentioned peru and like latin america in general has the widest skills gap in the world so that will definitely be key but i think another area that's going to be very very relevant is job tech and mm -hmm. how uh, individuals are able to secure uh, jobs high quality jobs and even remote work because as we know Uh, and this is very relevant for uh, countries like Peru that are highly centralized. Uh, talent is decentralized and, and is everywhere, but unfortunately, opportunity is not. So it, it, it will be key for us to, to have uh, platforms that are helping people to find high quality jobs. And similarly, um, another area that I think is key is um, these gig economy platforms that are allowing people that are independent or informal to have a decent way of living. Uh, Peru has a, like a, an informality rate of above 70% and these people are the ones who were most affected by the pandemic. And so I think these platforms are going to be also key to, to allow people to go back into having a job. That, that's true. That's true. And I think that's uh, kind of a challenge that many countries are facing right now. We have a shortage of employees also here in Canada. So we're facing that too. Uh, so, okay, for the next question is about how Canada and Peru can work together, for example, and to uh, promote a technology exchange and partnerships. So I'm going to start this with Pedro because Pedro was already here. I know that he already kind of experienced the ecosystem here. But uh, maybe uh, Emilio and Lucia can jump up after. So, uh, Pedro, um, I'm going to start with you. Absolutely. Uh, well, I, I actually was thinking of, of ways, you know, like uh, how, how like the Canadian and the Peruvian ecosystem could like interact and like create synergies between each other. Uh, I think there are some like Peru is not a big market. That's not a lie. Like there, there's not much to do about it. But I think it could be a really interesting ecosystem for Canadian entrepreneurs to, for example, try and pilot new solutions. Uh, let me make one example. Peru is a mining country, uh, but our mine tech ecosystem is still quite small. While well, Canada has a really developed mine tech ecosystem. Uh, I think Peru, for example, could be a really interesting place for Canadian startups to try new products and come and test them in a new market. And then, you know, like soft land and then expand into Latin America. And I think we could promote ourselves this way, for example. Okay, that, that's mm -hmm. good. And that's, that's a good approach. Actually, we, we are a mining, you know, very strong mining country. And I know that, uh, you know, many mining com companies actually work with Peru. <laughs> uh, uh, Lucia, what do you think about that? I, I agree with Pedro. I think we should take advantage of common grounds and explore technology exchanging areas that are relevant for both economies and mining and natural resources in general are, are one of like are, are the examples of those. Um, I think these industries are very traditional and they are ripe for disruption and and um, companies need to adjust in order to keep up with the trend of sustainability, right? So climate change is, is a hot topic right now and these industries need to find technological innovations uh, to operate in a more efficiently and environmental way. Um, and I think another interesting area of collaboration could be uh, for, for the, like to promote technology exchange uh, through large Canadian groups that are already operating in Peru. Like for instance, there's a lot of mining companies, but you have Scotiabank in the financial services sector. You have, let's say Brookfield, the large asset manager that's investing in, in infrastructure. Um, it would be interesting to see them more involved in, in investing in venture capital. Um, and whether it is via direct investments in, in Peruvian companies or, or through local funds, for instance, like Sarkantay, but for, I think this would be a very interesting way for them to access uh, innovative technologies that can boost their, their processes in general. That's true. And I, I know that the uh, innovation factory from Scotiabank is working in, in Peru, but I'm not sure how you guys are working together with, in, with the investment side. That's one of the things. Uh, but uh, Emilio, what is your take on this part? Well, yeah, I would like to make a point. Uh, I, I think it's a great idea when it comes to, to uh, mining, to exchange technology or to um, 
to uh, import technology from from Canada. Uh, you have companies like uh, Newmont that uh, that has this huge gold mining um, um, reservoirs in Peru. The only issue that I see there is that you have to keep in mind the uh, social part of it. So it's not just technology because um, you know it's, it's, it's bad. Like um, when when new technology comes in, the community sometimes or many times uh, do not have or do not do not receive uh, part of it. You know, it's just mining, and and that thought has to change. Otherwise, you know, we're going to run into social issues like uh, Peru is running into not right now, and we got to avoid that with the help of technology. So it's not just uh, making money, it's, it has to be social as well. Also, uh, when it comes to um, to exchange of knowledge, I think it's important. One thing, again, coming from the technology side of the house, I mean, uh, a lot of startups in Peru use technology uh, that myself I wouldn't use. I mean, I, I, I pretty much got my career in, in the US. That's where I I learned to program and the technology we use is completely different than the one in Peru, which might not be scalable or flexible. And, and that's an issue. So I think that with the knowledge that Canada could bring in that sense would be great for the new uh, developers, the new uh, technical people, uh, new generations in Peru. So that would be the kind of a change that I would also like to see. Okay, no, that, that's a really good idea. And thank you, Emilio, for that contribution. And uh, actually, in our chat, Fatima is uh, putting uh, there, uh, you know, a, a, ch a post saying that uh, they have worked with two startups from Canada through uh, their open innovation challenge uh, with public funding. So, um, and there is uh, some links that she's sharing there. Uh, so for those that are um, our Canadian audience, you can actually click on that and maybe, you know, participate in those challenges uh, that Fatima is, uh, you know, putting together here. So thank you, Fatima, for that. Um, and the last question, guys, because we are getting, uh, you know, to the end of this uh, chat. And thank you so much for being here and, you know, contributing to, uh, you know, this um uh, awesome ecosystem that that Peru has it is about the um, lessons learned during the pandemic. So, what do you think has been the lessons learned in the Peruvian ecosystem? I'm going to start with Lucia. Sure, I, and I think one key lesson uh, that that startups uh, have realized is that um, it is better to to focus on solving problems and closing gaps uh, in, in services and areas that are critical to society. As I mentioned before, education, health, financial services, agriculture, uh, because this makes companies uh, and their business models more resilient, right? Because even during moments of crisis, uh, people will still need to eat, people will still need to uh, get an education, will still get sick. Uh, so these are uh, segments that are definitely going to be critical, uh, regardless of the economic cycle. Uh, so I think a focus on this will definitely make uh, a company more resilient. Um, and I think another thing uh, from the perspective of, of investors, uh, at least, is uh, that startups need to focus on their financial sustainability in order to be prepared for, for market downturns when access to capital runs out. Um, I think like the days of uh, growth at all costs are, are long gone. And like we as investors are now more careful in selecting startups that are efficient in their use of capital. So I think that's another key key learning. Yeah, so I, I have a, an extra question for you, uh, Lucia, because we have seen actually a raise in, uh, you know, in venture capital and investment actually during the pandemic, but it seems like a, it's for the same startups that have been raising funds in the past, right? Uh, I'm not sure how you see it, uh, you know, going forward, uh, like investors are going to keep investing in the startups that are making rounds or, uh, you know, the ones that are actually starting with new ideas. I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, we're seeing a lot of innovation coming from earlier stage startups uh, that are, have been supported for many years by, by programs by the government. And I think those programs are like critical for, for the funnel of like companies and opportunities to keep growing. Uh, so I, I, and, and I think uh, the past year or so, while we've seen like 
great examples such as Creana raised the largest ethnic round, Series B ethnic round. We are also seeing earlier stage startups like Talent League, for instance, or, and many others that are doing a great job get interest from both international as well as local investors. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's just like a, a process of evolving and the Peruvian ecosystem is definitely maturing. Uh, we have, I think, the like the basis for, for it to take off, including a, a lot of great talent and people uh, developing innovative ideas, support from government to get going and increasing and like growing uh, investor base to allow these smaller companies to get to a stage where they can actually access the big pockets from international investors. So I think it's, I mean, it's, it's a process, right? We're not at the level as Brazil or Mexico, but we're, we're getting there. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. No, that, that's perfect. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Emilio, what is the big lesson learned during the pandemic for the Peruvian ecosystem? Well, one thing that, that nobody's mentioned is e-commerce and e-commerce has been, that's right. yeah. it's been the segment <laughs> that, that, that grew the most during the pandemic. And uh, one lesson learned out of, out of that is uh, the uh, use of technology, how technology was used uh, as in a reactive way, again, not proactive. Uh, so we're talking about technology like WhatsApp as well as others. But I'm not a speaker. So a lesson learned is um, to be more proactive, to um, to uh, do your homework, and and make sure that you're using the, the, the right technology in order to be able to grow. Uh, there, there are companies or startups that, that um, were born during the pandemic and they are no longer with us. And, and that is because sustainability, you know, they, could, they couldn't make it. Um, and the pandemic has, has taught us that um, technology is important, how you get to people is important. And in Peru, most of the technology was developed in Lima and, and people forgot about the different regions. You know, you have, like you mentioned at the very beginning, Arequipa, you have Cajamarca as another region, huge regions that also are important and in need of technology. So uh, a huge lesson learned is uh, Lima is not everything. You gotta go away from Lima. You have other people, other opportunities away from Lima. And that is something that needs to be taken into account. Okay, that, that's a good lesson, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Emilio. And um, Pedro, uh, what do you think will be the biggest lesson during the pandemic? So, so to, to keep on with the point made by Emilio, uh, I think that the world has changed. Uh, everything works remote now. Peru is not only Lima. I think mm -hmm. that now uh, startups, when they devise like a hiring or talent strategy, they need to think that they can have access to talent everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and they need to like really think on kind of uh, what are the different aspects that make themselves attractive to you know prospective employees. Uh, and I think that uh, maybe if, if there was a lesson is that startups should now like try and make hiring their number one priority now that, you know, like there's a lot more competition for talent and this is now like much more accessible. Um, I, I would also like to, to take some points that Lucia made because I thought they were really, really interesting on, on kind of uh, how has the proven ecosystem evolved during the, the last couple of years or so. Um, she mentioned the government programs uh, as many countries in Latin America I think that uh, Startup Peru, Innovate Peru, uh, kind of like they set up the foundations from what we have right now in the ecosystem. They were like absolutely important to build this ecosystem. Uh, now I think there are some efforts that the Peruvian government is making on to follow on and to help these startups actually achieve further growth and internationalization like, uh, like the Cofidas Fund of Funds. Uh, and I think it's really, really important to keep on working on these initiatives. Uh, as I was saying before, even though we're not the biggest market in Latin America, I think we can position ourselves to be really attractive to, to foreign founders, for example, from Canada, in the sense that they could come to Peru, try different pilots, try different products, use Peru as like uh, a base for soft landing and then expanding themselves to Latin America. And I think that as a country, maybe if we have like... Uh, a pending task, it would be to kind of think uh, what's 
our added value, what's our unique selling proposition as an ecosystem? Like, how can we attract uh, different founders and different funds and make this ecosystem grow? Right. No, that, that's a good one. Thank you so much, Pedro, for that. So just uh, uh, to make sure, you know, I have several points here before we are finishing because we are actually finishing at one. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, taking the time to answer in these questions. So first of all, uh, for those that are looking to, uh, you know, partnerships uh, right now, we have opened up a call for action for startups that are in Latin America and want to come to Canada. There is a free bootcamp with Hamilton Niagara in MedTech, um, EdTech, and Agricultural Technology. So if we have some Peruvian startups in that area, you have time actually today to send an application. The other side, uh, we, we have, uh, you know, besides this, um, you know, a, a information that we are passing here, we have a bootcamp for Canadian companies coming up. So uh, Samo is putting in the chat here. Uh, you know, the uh, Eventbrite link for those that want to attend that bootcamp. It's a free bootcamp for companies that are located in Toronto because it's supported by the city of Toronto. And uh, uh, finally, uh, we have, uh, you know, our next event next uh, month is going to be Brazil in the spotlight. Uh, so we are going to have some information about Brazil as well as some speakers from Brazil. Uh, uh, big thank you to uh, OVH Cloud, OCLO, Bright Immigration, the City of Toronto, Hamilton, and Niagara, um, you know, region.